partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Friends, will you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving? We're going to say this together. I am not what I do. I am not what I have. I am not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks. You can be seated. You ever feel like you are surviving, like you're treading water? It's very easy in life when we're just trying to obey God, we're just trying to be a good person, we're just we're trying to be faithful, to feel like life is just this cycle or treadmill that we can't seem to get ahead. Very often, it's in those times we wonder, has God abandoned us? Has God left us? Very often in those times, in our fear, in our disappointment, in our anguish, we think maybe God's far from us. Well, today I want to talk about the importance, if that's where God has you, if you truly believe where it is, to trust that God can use that place to make you into the best version of you. Today my recommendation to you is to be faithful to what God has called us to. You wonder, is this where God really has me? Sometimes he doesn't have you there, but sometimes he does. Sometimes he's called you to be faithful right where you are. Sometimes he's called you to the desert. Sometimes he calls you to the fire. Maybe you're going through suffering even right now. Maybe things are harder than they've ever been. You think, has God abandoned me? He'll never abandon you. And I want you to know that whatever it is you're going through, if you can continue to be faithful and trust in the Lord and just do the next right thing, do what he's called you to do, your fire will become a crucible. You know what a crucible is, right? It's that clay thing that you put metal into, alloys to separate the metal. It's purifying. It's what you use to purify gold, to purify silver, so that only the best comes out. Perhaps God is doing that in your life today. Let me tell you something. God cares more about who you're becoming than where you're going. God cares more about your character than your success. God cares more about making you who you need to be than he does about getting you where you need to go. The stories tell us this all over the place in the Old Testament. And this is just who God is. And by the way, God is never in a hurry. How old was Abraham before we hear anything about his life? Seventy. How old is Abraham when he receives the promise from God? Seventy. Now, seventy today is not that old. <laughs> but in his day, seventy was like really old. If you live to be seventy, if you live to be 50 or 60 in a, a world of sickness and pestilence and war, you were a lucky, blessed man. So here he is, a 70-year-old man in the twilight of what he thinks is the twilight of his life, and God makes him this promise that he's going to have kids who are going to bless the whole world. It's crazy. And you know what the Bible says? It says that Abram believed God and it was accredited to him as faith. He trusted God. I serve the kind of God that will let me do the life I'm having and just be the person I am, and then at 70, call me to something great. Oh, by the way, how long was it before God fulfilled that promise? Anybody know? 30 years. So how long was Abraham faithful to God's promise before it was fulfilled? 30 years. Now, 30 years when you're 70 is a lot scarier than 30 years when you're, tw say, 20. <laughs> he was 100 years old when God fulfilled the promise. I just want you to let you know, stay faithful to what you're doing. God still does great things in your life. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. Be faithful where you are. Trust God. Love God with all your heart. 
with all your soul, with all your mind, and He will get you where you need to go because He will make you who you need to become. Amen. This is the message of Isaiah 6, which is such a great story. It is the calling of the, prof- of the prophet Isaiah to proph- prophesy against the wickedness of Israel, and Israel truly was wicked at this time. You know, Israel is supposed to be God's people, called to be a blessing to the whole world. When Israel builds the temple, the temple is supposed to be like a new Eden, a new garden. In fact, all the symbolism is garden images to show that the garden is being remade in God's people as they pursue righteousness and goodness and love of God and love of their neighbor. And by the time Isaiah begins to prophesy, Israel has bowed down to Baal, which is the satanic god. They've turned their back on uh, on widows and orphans and the most vulnerable in their communities. And they've even gotten so evil as to offer child sacrifices to these Baal idols and these Asherah poles. And God finally says, enough, enough. My people would do this. And so Isaiah begins to prophesy against the people of Israel. And the message is this theme, purifying fire. Everybody say purifying fire. You see it all through Isaiah. This idea of this crucible type fire. Not a fire that kills, but a fire that purifies. A fire that burns that hurts, that's hot, that you don't like, but a fire that makes you who you're supposed to be. And this is the theme that Isaiah is saying. This fire is going to come. And actually the fire is God himself. That God himself is going to be among them. And that his holiness and his love and compassion will be so illuminating and hot and powerful that it will, in a burning way, burn away the sins of Israel. Fire is always a symbol for God in the Old Testament, almost always. You think of Abraham who walks in a covenant with a fire. You think of the pillar of fire and the wilderness and the fire on Sinai Sinai, and the chariot of fire and the fire that comes down with Elijah. You go on and on, a million examples. But fire is God. It's the real presence of God. And so this, is, this idea for Isaiah is that God as fire will be among us and it will hurt. But it will not destroy us. It will bring us life. It will make us who we're supposed to be. And so this all comes to the calling of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6. Now in, in Isaiah 6 he begins by saying, In the year King Uzziah died. Any one of his contemporaries reading this, they know who King Uzziah was. King Uzziah was the one who led uh, Israel for 50 years and brought 50 years of peace, righteousness, goodness. He was one of the few really good kings. He did not turn his back on the widow and the orphan. He did not bow down to idols. And he loved the Lord with all of his heart. And God blessed his people because of the leadership of their king. He's known as the leper king because though he was a good king, he was certainly flawed. And his great flaw was that he saw himself as super righteous. And so one day he wanted to go into the temple to burn incense. And this is something that only the priests are allowed to do. But I think this is me talking that maybe he thought he was so holy and so righteous that he himself could make this offering even though he wasn't a priest. And just as he's about to lay the incense on the altar... There's this earthquake and a crack breaks in the temple and a little bit of light comes through and the beam of light that goes across the middle of his face becomes leprosy. It's a symbol of him being unclean. And so for the rest of his life, King Uzziah rules from his home because to be kosher, you're not allowed to be in the temple. You're not allowed to be in these different places. Okay, so the year King Uzziah dies is just right when Israel begins to turn its back on God. And five years after his death, Assyria begins to invade. Okay, so he says, the year King Uzziah died, he says, I was in the temple. Now picture this temple. 
It's uh, not a lot larger, the actual temple part, than the sanctuary we're in now, made of stone, cubic kind of a shape, and dark on the inside. Some windows, but they're small and they have curtains over them. So picture a dark space with oil lamps and candles. So there's you know, dim light going against the thing. And there's people in there and they're worshiping. And they're having some kind of a maybe temple sacrifice or something like that. And it's a normal day. And they're worshiping. And Isaiah is a normal guy. And all of a sudden, I picture that there begins to be a trembling. And that a dark... A dark, scary feeling comes over the place. Maybe some of the candles flicker out. And then all of a sudden, there's smoke that begins to fill the temple. The word for holy in Hebrew is kadosh. Everybody say kadosh. And all of a sudden, you start to hear kadosh, 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 kadosh. And then out of the smoke, Boom! This big, bright light with beams coming through the smoke comes. And the whole temple is filled with the train that comes off of the robe of a king. And glory fills the whole temple. And then as Isaiah looks up and all the people look up, above this thing that is God, this fiery light in smoke, there are these angels called seraphim. You know, everybody say seraphim. Hebrew in, in seraphim, it literally means the burning ones. Tradition says that their wings or their whole bodies were on fire, that purifying fire, right? And they're flying around these beams of fire in this dark space, light shooting out. And they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. In Hebrew, it's kadosh. Kadosh! Kadosh! And it says that every time they say this word, Kadosh, the pillars tremble. Dust comes from the ceiling. Cracks form. Everything is trembling as it goes, Kadosh! 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 Adonai! Elohim! Servot! That word Servot is armies. God of armies. God of war. God of fire. God of wrath, right? So there's this boom, boom, and everybody is scared out of their mind. All I'm trying to say is it was very freaky. <laughs> it's a theophany. It's a theophany, not a vision. It's a total revelation of God's presence. And everybody is terrified. Imagine what you would do. What would you do? Well, I'll tell you what Isaiah did. He freaked out. And he, on his, I imagine him on his knees in total submission, says out loud, Woe is me, for I am, what? Ruined. I'm going to die. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Nobody sees God and lives. He is scared out of his mind. And one of these fiery beings that has six wings, six over its eyes so that they won't see the glory of the Lord, six on its back and six on its feet, and totally a flame like a ball of fire, goes and takes tongs and pulls a coal out of the fire, holds it in his hand, and this seraph starts flying right at Isaiah. You know this thing hissing in his hand. And Isaiah's like, I'm going to die! <laughs> and this angel comes up to him and takes this coal and presses it. You know, think of it as like a light. Like, just goes bzzz, right on his mouth. Do you think it hurt? I think it did. I don't think he was fireproof. Do you? That wasn't a heavenly coal. That was a coal from the actual temple altar that was used to burn and melt things. And this angel presses it on his mouth. Do you think it scarred his mouth? I hope it did. <laughs> anyway, so this angel presses a coal on his lips and then throws the coal aside and he looks at him and he says, by doing this, 
Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. What do you think happens in his mind there? Whoa, what? What does unclean lips mean, by the way? We often think cussing. Really, in the Jewish mind, that's not it. Unclean lips is going to be something like lying, uh, abolishing the law, maybe bearing false witness or dishonoring his parents. He probably did something that was really harmful to someone through speaking. And it was something that he carried a lot, a weight, a shame. Maybe it's something that he couldn't fix. Maybe it was something that was done to someone who already died and he couldn't say he was sorry. For whatever reason, Isaiah had carried around this guilt and he knew that to be in the presence of the the God of fire, that he would be consumed. He would be the chaff that would be burned away. He would not remain. But God revealed himself, not as a fire that destroys, but a purifying fire. Isaiah was the first one to receive that purifying, cleansing fire. Yes, it hurt. Yes, it burned. Maybe it scarred. But it took away his sin. It took away his shame. And in that moment, he was a new man. I believe that angel looked at him with love. The love that comes from the heart of the Father. He didn't say it's okay what you did. He said it's been atoned for through pain. And then Isaiah goes from, I'm going to die, to I've been totally redeemed and forgiven. That's an amazing feeling. If you've never been forgiven of something horrible, there's there's nothing quite like it. In fact, Jesus once tells a story when he's ministering to teachers of the law and religious leaders in his community, and a prostitute comes in and begins to wash his feet. He basically ignores her and and he does it as a teaching element and people say if if Jesus knew who this woman was he would not and he was a prophet he would not let her wash his feet and they begin snickering and then knowing all of this is happening Jesus asked Peter a question he says Peter there was a man who was owed five denarii and another man who was owed 500 denarii and he forgave both men who do you think loved him more And Peter looks at Jesus and he says, the one who is forgiven of the great sum. And he says, that's right. He who has been forgiven of little loves little. He who has been forgiven of much loves much. I think when Isaiah's mouth, when his sin was atoned for by the purifying fire that he will prophesy about later, his heart is full of love for God. And I believe he goes from absolute terror to absolute adoration of the throne of God. He goes from I'm going to die to I'm redeemed, I'm forgiven, I'm saved. Maybe he begins to say Kadosh, 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 Adonai Elohim, Adonai Tzavot. And then God finally speaks for the first time And in the temple, remember, there's a bunch of people there. They're all standing around witnessing this amazing thing. And God says aloud, Who will go for us? Whom shall we send? Doesn't say where they're going. Doesn't say why. Doesn't say when. He's just asking for obedience. He's asking for a hero. He's asking for someone that will do whatever this thing is. And I believe nobody said anything because they were scared out of their mind. But Isaiah, whose heart had been changed through this act from this angel full of joy and love for God, says, I will do anything for you. And he just raises his hand. Maybe he stands up and he says, here I am. Send me. Send me. I'll go. And then God says to him, I'm sending you to your people, Israel. And they're not going to listen to you. You're going to preach to them about the poor. And they're going to shut their ears. You're going to preach to them about the orphans and the widows. And they're going to calcify and harden their hearts. You're going to preach to them against idolatry and against child sacrifice. And they're going to hate you. And not one person is going to listen to you. And not one person is going to repent ever. 
I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a call to failure. If God called me to plant a church no one would attend, to preach sermons no one would listen to, to go on missionary trips where no one would be saved, would I really want to do that? Could I do that? Would you? If God called you to fail, would you obey? Some of us say yes, but why? Why? I can tell you why Isaiah did it. Because he loved God with all his heart with all his soul, with all his strength, he loved God and trusted God. And it was accredited to him as righteousness. And so Isaiah says, okay, I'll go. I'll preach to people and no one will listen. And then he asks a question with chutzpah, which is this great Hebrew word that's taken on a weird thing today, but it's faith. And he says, how long? And God basically says, forever until the Babylonian exile. And Isaiah says, all right, I'm going. And this is Isaiah's call. It is a call to be faithful, to trust that if I am going somewhere where people are going to hate me, where no one's going to listen to me, where according to the world standard, I'm going to achieve nothing, I'm going to trust that it's okay because my life is for an audience of one. I don't want the applause of anyone else. I just want his applause. And I trust that if I live for him, then in the end, I will know it was worth it. And I'll be glad that I didn't pursue all the vain, lifeless things that promise so much and deliver so little. There's nothing like following the Lord in the desert. There's nothing like being with God in the fire. There's nothing like being totally isolated and feeling completely alone. But right there, Jesus Christ meets you and puts his arm around you and says, I'm your brother. You're never alone when you're with me. I'll protect you, my sister. I'll protect you, my brother. I love you. See, that's, that's what God does when we go through tough times. You know, in the Old Testament, Egypt is rarely called Egypt. It's always called Pharaoh's land. Everybody say Pharaoh's land. Pharaoh's land. And then the lush part of Israel, Galilee, you'd think that would be called or God's land, right? No, it's called Israel's land. Everybody say Israel's land. Israel. Guess what the desert is called? Guess what the desert is called? God's land. The desert is God's land. The place where without him you'll die. This is where the law is given. This is where Jesus goes when he's tempted. And some of you are in the desert right now. You're there right now. And you want to get out of there. You're hot. You're dying. You're, you're in danger. There's scorpions. You, you're completely alone. You're out of water. You don't know what's coming next. And God is telling you, stay faithful. Let the sun in this desert be unto you as a purifying fire. Let it bring something to you that you can only get here in this place. Don't endure all the suffering and return back to Judea or Galilee empty-handed. Wait long enough for me to fulfill my promise. And so that's my encouragement to you uh, friends, is that whatever you're going through, you know, it's in those times of difficulty that we recognize God is with us. You might think that everything you're doing with your kids is a failure. You might think everything you're doing in your business, your ministry, or all these things, you're like, I've just, been tread I've just been on this treadmill for so long. God is saying, stay faithful, my daughter. Stay faithful, my son. Do what I've called you to do. Become who I've called you to become and I will get you where you need to be. So Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. You say when we lack faith, ask for it. So we ask for it, Lord. Give us faith. Help us, Lord, to be like Abraham, that at the year, age of 70, for 30 years in the desert, he endured difficulty. Help us to be like Isaiah when he's called to, to fail almost. We see Isaiah was such a great success, actually, that even now we look at his words and we're inspired and He's maybe the most quoted prophet by Jesus. He changed the whole world because 
you know, he knew you didn't call him to failure, the world standards, but he, he knows, Lord, that, that you, you always call us, even though it doesn't look like it, to greatness. Lord, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today, and we'd like to say thank you for all the ways you continue to support Hour of Power worldwide on its mission. God is on the move and great things are happening. You know, I love the Greek proverb that says, society grows great when old men plant trees whose shade they know they shall never sit in. How many of us are sitting in the shade of trees that were planted by a parent, a grandparent, a teacher, or a mentor? I don't know about you, but I want to be a person like that, someone who is so rooted in Christ that their witness will transform future generations and enable them to know their worth in Jesus. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In our own parenting, Bobby and I believe it's so important to connect with them and teach them how to connect with others. By affirming the dignity of those around us and agreeing with what Jesus says about them, we change the world one relationship at a time. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we wanna send you the beautiful Creed of the Beloved Sun Catcher. We believe that internalizing the powerful truths in this creed can transform your life. Call, write, or go online today and request the Creed of the Beloved Sun Catcher. With the words of the creed etched in glass, this floral adorned ornament will be a stunning addition to your home or patio. This seven and a half by seven inch metal framed sun catcher is secured with a twine hanger for easy display. As you read and say aloud the affirmations that you are not what you do, not what you have, and not what people say about you, your true identity as God's beloved will take root in your heart and you will be transformed. We'll send you this one-of-a-kind decoration with your generous gift of any size. For your gift of $50 or more, we'll include Pastor Bobby's Connect to Cultivate, Leading the Way DVD. In this special sermon, Bobby explains how to develop meaningful connections, the kind that enable you to lead by putting other people first. We'll also include this two-sided Connect to Cultivate reminder card with Proverbs 22.6 on the front and reminders of ways to cultivate relationships on the back. Call, write, or go online today to request these valuable resources and learn to reestablish and strengthen the relationships in your life. The Hour of Power would not be on the air today if it weren't for you and people like you who bless us with their generous gifts. Your financial support keeps the Hour of Power on the air and enables us to make a positive difference in the lives of viewers around the world. We simply just can't do it without you. So please call, write, or go online with your generous gift today. God loves you and so do we. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is a